A lot has been said about one, if not the biggest criminal of the Netherlands. For years he has been in the headlines, but we never really heard his side of the story. What you are about to watch will entail every single detail of his story, from the violent crimes he is accused of, to his drug smuggling organisation and his most important associates, including his 22 year old son. Oh, and don't forget his plans to escape from the Netherlands most strict and secured prison. Ever wondered what goes through the mind of whom the media dubbed to be the most vicious criminal in the Netherlands? Well, you might be in for a surprise. What he's had to say about all these accusations towards him? Thinking. For us, nog heb ik nog niks te melden. Niks to melden. Okay. This is the story about Ridwan Tachi. My last video about Ridwan Tachi has already been more than 10 months ago. It was actually the fourth video I ever uploaded on this channel. It's a topic that has held Dutch as well as international media busy for years, and it's still not finished. I really wanted to wait a significant time before covering him again so that there was plenty of new information to talk about and I can tell you there definitely is. For those of you who are unfamiliar, who is Ridwan Tachi? Ridwan Tachi was born in Morocco in 1977 and moved to the Netherlands with his family in 1980. At around the age of 14, he joined a street gang called the Bad Boys, or just Bad, which mainly engaged in petty crimes as well as street races. Despite being a good student, he dropped out of school at 17 to focus on hash smuggling. He is then allowed to operate part of the hashish lines from Morocco to Spain once set up by his grandfather and goes on to expand them. Sometime later, instead of using the lines to smuggle hash, Ridwan used them to smuggle coke, which was way more lucrative. At a rapid pace, he managed to work his way up and had gotten so wealthy that he became one of the new leaders in the Dutch underworld. For a long time, Ridwan was fairly unknown to Dutch police. There are several explanations for this, but the most important one is that he had himself deregistered from the Municipal Personal Records database in 2009, a trick criminals often use to stay under the radar. If police arrested Ridwan a day before the 27th of June 2015, they would have absolutely no idea who they were dealing with. In their systems, they would have come across two traffic fines, one for speeding in 2010 and one for talking on the phone behind the wheel in 2012. A deeper dive into his documentation had revealed some old convictions for burglary and weapons possession from his childhood bad boys years, but that would be about it. It wasn't until exactly the 27th of June 2015 that Ridwan's name popped up in a police file. A man named Ebrahim Buzu started talking to the police and wanted to file a police report against this man called Ridwan Tahi. Ebrahim was a criminal who said that Ridwan had it out for him and wanted him gone. He went on to tell that Ridwan sold over 1,000 kilos of coke per month and had people taken out if he wanted to. He even stated that Ridwan Tahi was some kind of maniac on drugs. Keep this detail in mind. Police had a hard time comprehending what he said as they had absolutely no clue who Ridwan was at the time. They even wrote his name wrong, writing Redwan with an E instead of an I. Then, just a month later, the name Ridwan Tahi turned up in an investigation that followed a major weapons discovery in Nieuwegein. This led to several arrests, of which some men belonged to the bad boys when they were younger. But still, the name did not ring immediate bells. Little did they know is that he would go on to become the country's most wanted man and turn the entire country upside down with his violence. Over the course of the years, Ridwan would constantly clash with rivals, who he then had taken out or made an attempt to do so. However, this ruthlessness wasn't only aimed at rivals. He would also order people to be eliminated if they did as little as talking bad about him. Fellow criminals, snitches, lawyers, news reporters, and innocent people all fell victim to his violence. No one was safe. On the 12th of January 2017, a hit ordered by Ridwan failed miserably as the wrong man was taken out. In retrospect, we can say that this incident marked the beginning of the end for him. After this incident, a member of his organization, Nabil B, who orchestrated some hits for Ridwan, decided to talk to the police and became a key witness against Ridwan and his organization. This did not mean that the hits stopped there. In March 2018, the brother of key witness Nabil B is taken out, allegedly per the orders of Ridwan as revenge for him becoming a key witness and snitching on Ridwan. As if that was not enough, 
In September 2019, Nabil B's lawyer, Derek Viersum, was taken out as well. Everyone who was against Ridwan would be eliminated. Even though evidence was piling up, Dutch law enforcement had yet to find and arrest Ridwan. A hunt ensued for the man that remained under the radar for a long time, but had now become the most wanted man of the Netherlands. It was speculated that he was either in Suriname, enjoyed protection in Iran, Costa Rica, Colombia, or Dubai. No one knew for sure. In an attempt to increase the pressure on Ridwan, Dutch police decided to share a picture of him with the public. By now, it's one of the most well-known pictures of him. It's the picture of him blowing a kiss. Not the typical image you have in mind of a vicious criminal, right? However, the story behind this picture is quite intriguing and shows a different side to this notorious criminal. The image was retrieved from the intercepted PGP messages sent in April 2016, according to investigating authorities. Ridwan is having a conversation with his eldest son, Faisal, who was 15 years old at the time. Faisal says, I'm going to go go-karting this afternoon, Dad. Go enjoy yourself, his father sends back. Thank you. Send a selfie, Daddy. Haha, writes his son. As a response, Tahi sent the now iconic picture. Two hours later, Faisal sent a picture of the school board. It shows that Faiz won. Look who came in first place, Faisal wrote to his father. May God reward you, Ridwan replied. Thank you, Daddy. Love you. It's a conversation that could be between any father and son that love each other dearly. However, in this case, the father was the country's most wanted man, and the 15-year-old didn't have a clue which trajectory his life would take because of his father's decisions. At that point in time, Ridwan was already on the run for a while. He'd not spent time with his family for a long time, which led to his wife and mother of his children being upset. You need your kids around you just like we need you, she sent to him via her PGP phone. You have been gone for too long from your family and have resorted to expressing your anger on everybody who comes in your way. Do you know that even Faisal is very bothered by that? Some time ago, he said that once he's older, that he will get his revenge on everybody that caused us not to be with our father. Don't you see that your kids are full of rage and it will never end once they grow older? They will still be filled with rage and seeking for revenge that everything repeats itself. Then on the 16th of December 2019, he was arrested in Dubai in his luxury villa on the Palm after a long manhunt. Dubai police followed more than 10 people who were allegedly in contact with Ridwan. This led them to the villa on the Palm. However, the villa looked totally abandoned. All the shutters were closed. There were no cars, nor was there any movement during the day. In the nighttime, however, there was one man who threw away the trash every night, right before it would get picked up by the garbage truck. This man would also drop off medicines and food sometimes. This was a signal for the police that there were indeed people inside the house. Dubai police still did not know what to expect. Rumors back in the Netherlands were that Ridwan may have had plastic surgery to change his facial features. Would they even be able to recognize him? They decided to go through with their mission and entered the home on that 16th of December. And despite the limited information, they were right and found Ridwan inside the villa. In the villa, police found large sums of money, Dutch magazines reporting on his crimes, laptops and smartphones. According to the officers on the scene, Ridwan was in shock when they came barging in. During his arrest, Ridwan claimed he was his own prisoner, paranoid and without freedom. He surrendered without resistance, and that's where, according to him, 72 hours of pure pain started. According to a statement Ridwan released after his arrest, he was held in an ice-cold room where he was tasered, beat up, fed unknown chemicals, and more. He went on to say that this picture that was spread of him after his arrest was edited. I'm telling this because it's a fake photo. All the wounds in my face, like my broken nose, have been photoshopped out. Through his lawyer, Inez Vesky, he then spread the real pictures, clearly showing a beat-up Ridwan. On these pictures, you can see the footprint of a boot on his forehead, a swollen ankle because of tie wraps that were too tight, and taser marks on his shoulder. He did look pretty beat up. After this rough interrogation, he was extradited to the Netherlands and jailed in the Dutch maximum security prison called the Ebi. And even though the failed hit in 2017 was already the beginning of the end, remember the hit that turned Nabil B into a crown witness against him? Well, Ridwan's arrest marked a point of no return. A trial spanning years would follow, and it would not only affect him and his family, it would affect the entire nation with the loss of a lawyer and a renowned journalist. And not to forget about the rest of his organization and business partners, of course. 
The Dutch police were eager to fight against the entire criminal power structure around Ridwan and were not going to rest until they succeeded. No one could have expected who were part of his organization. Stay with me, because we are about to get into a conversation with the man himself. A month after his arrest, Ridwan was scheduled for his first interrogation in the Ebi. The transcript of this interrogation has been partly shared. Besides the PGP messages accredited to him, it is one of the first views inside Ridwan's mind where we can, in a sense, hear him talk and get to understand how he looked at things. It's January 2020, when Ridwan is brought into the interrogation room that is built especially for him in the prison complex. The interrogation room was equipped with state-of-the-art cameras and microphones. Once in the interrogation room, the only person he recognized was his lawyer Inez Vesky. One of the interrogators introduced himself as Ron, the other as Ronald. Five of their colleagues were watching from the recording room. Since interrogations generally tend to flow better when the interviewee is at ease, the interrogators tried to normalize the situation a bit. The rules in force within the Ebi had been slightly softened. For instance, Ridwan was not interrogated behind glass, and his lawyer was allowed to attend the interrogation in the same room. Furthermore, Ridwan was brought to the interrogation studio without the usual handcuffs and other safety measures. This first interrogation is what investigators call a social interrogation, to get to know the suspect better and put him somewhat at ease. Ridwan declined the drink offered to him by the two detectives in the room, and that's when the interrogation started. How would you prefer to be addressed? One interrogator asked. You can call me whatever you like, Ridwan replied. But what is your need? I have no need for anything, Ridwan said. We are as transparent as we can towards you, one of the interrogators said. To which Ridwan angrily replied, Transparent? The prosecution is not that transparent. These days, everything is swept under the rug, right? The tone was set. About the crimes he allegedly committed, he only expressed his annoyance. Please look, let's just be clear. There is no such thing as truth in my case. Everything is based on lies and rumors. Everything that happens in the Netherlands, I probably did. So now that I'm jailed, all crime is nicely solved, right? Nothing happens outside anymore. Ridwan is also upset about the media. You have trial by media, and in my case, judged by media. I get talked bad upon every day on every newspaper and on every television show, etc. After a few hours of Ridwan voicing his displeasure with his rest and the way he has been treated thus far, he showed a more human side of him. I have started smoking less. I don't really like rice. The meals in here are terrible. Even my cats eat better. I just like bread with cheese, halal salami or chicken. He goes on to explain why. When he greets people, he puts his hand on his heart as a sign of respect. Humanity is basically good though. How people develop themselves is their business. He admits that he does not pray, saying, Maybe in the future I will become a good Muslim and pray five times a day. Who knows? I have always avoided hard drugs. The only thing I have ever used is a joint. And on occasions, I have had wine. White wine, red wine. I am not a good Muslim when it comes to drinking. When we used to go out, I used to drink sometimes. Other than that, I don't have an addiction. Sometimes I drink one night, and then sometimes I don't drink for six months. So that I am a drug-using mad maniac? Unfortunately, I have to disappoint you. I have never used drugs in my life. Obviously directly referring to the rumors about him being a coked out maniac, which was spread first by Ebrahim Buzu back in 2015, remember? As the conversation went on, he said, family matters are private. I moved with my family to the Netherlands on my second birthday. There were only five other Moroccan families there. I grew up mostly among Dutch people, so I speak Dutch very well. He also touched on sports saying, I only watch the summaries. I'm not going to watch for 90 minutes how the ball goes back and forth. To which the interrogator asked, who would you cheer for if the Netherlands played Morocco on the World Cup? Ridwan replied by saying, both of them. If the Netherlands win, it's great. If Morocco wins, it's great. If the Netherlands play alone, then I am for the Netherlands. But Morocco is a bad team, right? Then it was time for the interrogators to get to the points and quit the small talk. That's when the conversation turned a bit more hostile and awkward especially when they had to go over his personal data. One of the interrogators believed Ridwan said unfortunately yes to the comment that everyone knows his surname. I did not say unfortunately. Do you hear me say unfortunately? The other interrogator believed that he actually heard it too. My colleague said your name is already known. Then you said unfortunately yes. 
An annoyed Ridwan replied, I didn't say that, you said that. Can you rewind the tape? The detective laughed and said that they will do that indeed. Ridwan would not let it go. Just rewind, he said. I didn't say unfortunately, so don't put words in my mouth. Sometime later, Ridwan becomes annoyed at being asked for his name. My name? It is in all newspapers every day in all media, in all TV shows. And then you ask my name? Detectives find it extraordinary that Ridwan managed to stay out of the hands of investigation authorities for so long. He said, I never hit. I just sat quietly waiting for you guys. It took a bit long. Regarding his arrest, he said, one of the officers put a firearm to my head. Look, they are going to deny it, but I know what happened there. I know what it was like. I had to sit in a freezer with a temperature below zero to be interrogated, without sleeping. Pills were put in my drink. My nose closed. The craziest things. I was kept up for three whole days straight. They beat me up severely. I was so battered, I couldn't open my eyes. I was too swollen. They then took a passport photo, which is the photo that was also released to the media. As the interrogation progressed, Ridwan started shuffling back and forth on his chair. Did he have any physical discomfort? My tailbone, it's pretty battered, yes, he said. He indeed cannot sit for long. What happened? Well, if you lie down, I can show you what they did to me back in Dubai. What can I say about it? What they did there is not pleasant, let me put it that way. Otherwise, I would still be able to walk straight. At the far end of the interrogation, one of the interrogators asked Ridwan, what do you think about the fact that it is already stated that, if proven, we will go for life? To which Ridwan replied coldly, you can better spend the money from this fake trial on the teacher shortage, on healthcare, or on the police shortage, instead of on me. If the judge just gives me a life in prison tomorrow, okay, so be it. Next case. Such an interesting quote. If the judge gives me life in prison tomorrow, okay, so be it. Next case. Do you think he really took it this lightly? Or was he just bluffing? As the interrogation ended, Ridwan said, if you want to start talking small talk about religion or whatever, about history or about Camp Wucht, so be it. But other than that, I have nothing at all to say. Ideally, I would have a cassette tape where I could record the phrase, right to remain silent, and then I could play it all the time. In the following interrogations, Ridwan indeed did not say a word anymore. One can only wonder what he would have to say about what was going to happen to his entire organization. Because the next month, on the 7th of February 2020, Ridwan Tahi's right-hand man, Said Razuki, was arrested. Together with Ridwan, Said rose up to the criminal ladder and went from petty crimes to selling hash to the real deal, coke smuggling. Within the organization, Ridwan became the shot caller and Said, his trusted right-hand man. He was also somewhat of a wiser figure. Where Ridwan would act without thinking, Said would take the time to first think things through. As the second man in line, Ridwan would give Said assignments he wanted to get done. Said in his turn would push this assignment along the line to the right people. If someone had a message for Ridwan, Said would be the one the message was given to, to which he would share it with Ridwan and vice versa. Said also took care of getting the hits done that Ridwan ordered. In addition, Said took care of the product. If a shipment came in, he made sure the kilos were distributed. 50 kilos here, 200 there, and so on. As the two became increasingly more sought after by law enforcement all over the world, Said fled to Colombia. It took months of investigation to arrest him. Undercover agents embarked on a thorough investigation in Colombia, targeting Said based on a vague tip, assuming that he was in the country. They went on to uncover his interests, habits, and what motivated him. As plan one, they used advanced listening devices on an airplane and flew it over Medellin's upscale neighborhoods to find leads, but Said proved elusive by using an old, untraceable phone. For plan two, they shifted their focus to his religious activities, monitoring the city's three mosques. After weeks of surveillance, they spotted an older man near a mosque who appeared to be Said. The agents followed him to a high-rise building in Sabaneta. They immediately rented apartments in the same building to observe him. Said rarely left his apartment, except to go to the mosque. He ordered halal food, so he did not have to leave his home, though this was ultimately what gave him away. Over the course of 11 months, they obtained more information about him and then finally managed to get a high quality picture confirming his identity. Shortly after, they overheard him discussing leaving the country, triggering an urgent response from law enforcement. 
Colombia's Comandos Junglas, their highly trained anti-narcotics enforcement, stormed Said's apartments on February 7, 2020. In a desperate attempt to escape, he jumped from a 15-meter high window. He got injured and couldn't walk anymore, leading to his arrest. Surprisingly, Said lived in a small, dirty apartment, the total opposite of what we usually imagine a wealthy drug smuggler lives like. After being detained for over a year in Colombia, Said was extradited to the Netherlands in December 2021. He was part of the extensive Marengo trial. Prosecutors called him completely relentless and eventually demanded a life sentence in February 2023. Said was suspected of being involved in multiple hits, multiple attempted hits, and multiple hits that were being planned. Absolute nonsense, he said, after hearing the demand. He denied all accusations that were made. In July 2023, Said was allowed to speak on the last day of court. He prepared two sheets pleading his innocence and denying that he had anything to do with any hits or criminal organization. I have never given the order to have someone removed off the playing field. I don't have anything to do with Mr. Tahi, he said. Well, regardless of this statement, this meant that one pillar of Ridwan's organization was gone, but police had several more to go. On the 7th of October, 2021, Ridwan's cousin, Jawad F, was arrested in Morocco. Jawad is the oldest son of Ridwan's oldest sister. He was arrested for his involvement in a hit gone wrong. Back in November 2017, two hitters had gotten orders to take out Mustafa F in Morocco, a successful drug smuggler and known rival of Tahi. However, due to a big mistake, the hitters took out an innocent 26-year-old medical student, which also happened to be the son of an important Moroccan judge. The young man was wearing a white t-shirt, just like Mustafa, and sat in the chair where Mustafa had sat shortly before. Jawed's involvement in this hit got him sentenced to six years in prison in Morocco. That was not the only hit he was involved in though. The name of 28-year-old Jawad, nicknamed Bole, had featured in numerous major police investigations in the Netherlands for years, and they wanted to prosecute him too. For example, he has been formally charged as a suspect of directing preparations for the hit on lawyer Dirk Viersen, the lawyer of Crown Witness Nabil B, on the 18th of September 2019. Furthermore, he allegedly orchestrated the attack on another criminal rival of Ridwan. This man was lured to a place in Utrecht on the 30th of October 2019 under false pretenses of a drug deal. Instead, he was beaten with numerous objects, a beatdown he survived only by luck. Jawad was basically another one of Ridwan's men when it came to exerting violence. Ja, neef en advocaat inderdaad van Ridwan Tachi, vrijdag opgepakt. Ja, hij was volop actief als... Een paar uur geleden bracht de politie het nieuws naar buiten... dat er opnieuw een man is aangehouden in verband met de moord op advocaat Dirk Wiersum. Volgens verschillende kranten gaat het om de neef van Ridwan Tagi, de meest gezochte crimineel van Nederland... die door het Openbaar Ministerie wordt gezien als opdrachtgever voor de moord op de advocaat. De advocaat en neef van Ridwan Tagi is opgepakt. Dat gebeurde toen hij hem vandaag bezocht in de extra beveiligde inrichting. Just a day after Jawad's arrest, police arrested another person of Ridwan's organization, though this one was highly unexpected. On the 8th of October, 2021, Ridwan's cousin, Youssef Tahi, was arrested. But Youssef was more than just a cousin. He was also a lawyer, Ridwan's lawyer. This position allowed him to visit Ridwan frequently in the maximum security prison. Youssef was basically the most important link for Ridwan to the outside world after he got jailed. He was first granted entry to the maximum security prison on the 12th of March 2021. In the months that followed, there were exactly 98 moments of contact between Youssef and Ridwan Tahi, including 22 visits. These visits sometimes lasted as long as two to three hours, though they used only a fraction of this time to talk about their judicial case. Among other things, Ridwan and Youssef communicated about drug trafficking, planning violence against a former brother-in-law of Ridwan Tahi, bribing government officials, and plans for a breakout. Especially that last topic of discussion was very important. Despite there being a rule in place that a lawyer and his client cannot be tapped, there was a reasonable doubt that Youssef was misusing his position as Ridwan's lawyer. In addition, police got a tip that even while locked up in the maximum security prison, Ridwan was somehow continuing to run his operation. This caused the sacred rule to be broken, and every conversation of Ridwan and Youssef was being listened to without them knowing. The two could be heard whispering in Dutch and Arabic and constantly writing and scratching on paper. Sometimes, they would start to talk loudly in Dutch and Arabic about the most random things to then switch it back to whispering again. 
This indicated that apparently the communication they had was intended to remain hidden from others. This caused for even more suspicion, to which they made another drastic decision to hang up cameras. The footage of this camera showed Ridwan writing on a piece of paper and then showing it to Yusuf. Yusuf in turn made a picture of the writing via his iPad. Yusuf would also show Ridwan pictures via his iPad, to which Ridwan replied by writing on paper again, and so forth. Some messages showed that Ridwan was still reigning over his organization. For example, one message read, 9 million to woman of undisclosed name, 5 million to his mother, and 2 million to man who lives with his mother. Once Ridwan's messages were too long, to which Yusuf replied by writing on his iPad, too much words, short is the key to success, and write clear, I have transcribe it to which Ridwan simply nodded his head. Well, it didn't stop with discussing business arrangements. Besides discussing Tahi's operations, they were actively discussing and organizing two violent prison break plans as well. One of those was called Plan Bios. The other was called Plan C. Plan Bios was supposed to be a prison break that would require the help of highly trained and heavily armed Navy SEALs and 1,500 liters of oil to make the roads surrounding the prison slippery. It even entailed cutting off all communication and electricity surrounding the jail. Here are some of the intriguing messages the two wrote to each other. Like I said earlier, the men mixed speech with text when communicating. The following is purely what was written. It must be said that sometimes things don't immediately make sense either. Yusuf said, we'll get a phone call today. Undisclosed name and his group will work with undisclosed name to discuss BIOS. Do you agree? Ridwan replied, I don't understand anything about BIOS. This isn't child's play. If undisclosed name doesn't come, I will not live or will never ever see daylight again. I can't say anything about BIOS yet, only once I know their plan. Thought they were ready with everything. After a reply from Yusuf, Ridwan stresses once again the importance of plan BIOS. BIOS isn't a game, my life is dependent on it. Why is it taking so long? BIOS has priority. BIOS has to go perfect, these people are expecting it, so it has to be silenced, not by brute force. Once I am out, make sure there are a lot of bikes. Bike in front, bike behind. Check for cameras on the escape route. Check YouTube for movies about my cell. You'll see the window and which iron it is. Make sure that everything is planned perfect. No dumb guys. I want Navy SEALs. Real guys, not robbers. Then in a meeting months later, Ridwan clearly expresses his frustration with how long it is all taking and that there is still no plan. Still nothing yet. It has to be the Navy SEAL way. You think too easy, really. Make expenses, give them guys some money. Not too much, only when well done. Blueprint with plan, floor plan. Everything should have been there already. I get a bad feeling from your talks and promises. I want to see exact plan now. I ask 1000 times for plan, nothing now. Blueprint soon, otherwise F off. So besides plan BIOS, they also had plan C. The men wanted to kidnap four EBI employees and demand a release, though it was discussed less elaborate than Plan BIOS. Ridwan said for Plan C, Those names need to be found out. That is Plan C. If I say code word Mega Mindy, it is time for Plan C, okay? Those names are important. The names of the four people were actually found. This resulted in them having to go in hiding for a long time. During these lengthy sessions, Yusuf realized the risks he took and wrote, In case it ever comes out, it's clear that there is information brought out. It did come out. Yusuf Tahi was arrested. In January 2023, he was sentenced to five and a half years in prison. During his trial, Yusuf Tahi said that he felt seriously pressured by his cousin. However, the court saw insufficient evidence for this. The defendant himself took the decision to assist his cousin. There are no signs of pressure. The court considered it proven that Yusuf Tahi played a key role in cousin Ridwan's criminal organization. Defendant was more than just an errand boy. He also thought about how he could aid the criminal organization, the court stated. Yusuf said the following in court about his nephew. He tells you information, and even though you don't want to hear it, it is shared with you. That is how you get sucked into it. Millimeter by millimeter. Not doing what was said could bring me in serious trouble. Not cooperating would make me look like an informant. I knew too much. I hoped to get out of this quietly, but I guess it did not work. So at this moment, in Ridwan's story, we are now four years after his arrest in Dubai. Just a quick summary of what we have seen so far. His right-hand man, Said, his cousin Jawad F, and his lawyer Yusuf were arrested. Plus, rather crucial as well, his breakout plans were discovered. 
quite a lot, right? Well, we are far, far from finished. But first, I am constantly improving the quality and the duration of the videos for you all. This one took a lot of work. You could immensely help the channel by taking a quick second to leave a like and a comment that doesn't cost a thing, but will allow me to keep on improving and serving you with the best quality videos. A true win-win. Also, be sure to subscribe and help me reach my goal of 100,000 subscribers. You're the best. Let's get back to it. Because Yusuf Tahi was not Ridwan's only lawyer that would see time behind bars, his other lawyer, Inez Veski, got herself in trouble too. Inez Veski is one of the Netherlands' most renowned criminal lawyers. She's also known for her particular looks. However, don't let these looks fool you. She became Ridwan's lawyer in 2019, shortly after his extradition from Dubai. Many immediately questioned why she took him on as a client. Right after Inez became Ridwan's lawyer, PGP messages showed how his family desperately looked for ways to still communicate with him. Not much later, Inez Veski had a PGP phone herself too, to solely stay in touch with Ridwan's son Faisal, who lived in Dubai. This did not seem to sit well with her. You understand I can't say anything. I also hope this is not shared with third parties as well, a message sent by her read. Faisal, in his turn, also instructed his aunts, Ridwan's sister, back in the Netherlands before every visit Inez had with Ridwan in prison. This aunt would frequently visit Inez in person as well. One of the messages Faisal sent to his aunt was, When are you with the lawyer? Can you tell her that she turns on her phone? And can you also ask if she maybe could find out what my father would like me to do? Another message read, I think aunts that you also have to ask the lawyer to visit dad tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, since there is a lot to talk about. In other PGP messages, the son once again inquires about a decision that needs to be made. Did she have anything nice to say? Can she also ask if there is something, how we can help him? Also, please have her ask what I have to do about undisclosed names money. If she can ask that as a priority so he doesn't keep emailing about it. Messages, however, also show that Inez was not responding fast enough, according to Faisal. Lawyer is being strange. Not once she emailed since she visited him. Usually she emails every few days. Sometime later, another message, complaining about Inez's communication. That lawyer is just crazy, never emailing, never texting. She is a crazy weird woman. Out of nowhere, on the 21st of April 2023, the breaking news erupted that Miss Inez Veski was arrested by Dutch police. All the headlines in the Netherlands were about her that day. Her office in Rotterdam and her home were raided and thoroughly searched by police, which is quite unusual to do because of the strict confidentiality laws a lawyer has to operate under. Just like Yusuf Tahi, she was accused of being part of Ridwan's organization and serving as a messenger for him. Because despite Yusuf being behind bars, police still had the feeling that Ridwan was able to communicate with the outside world. During a hearing in July 2022 in the Yusuf case, her name got dropped as a messenger as well. She was actually the first who had delivered messages on behalf of Ridwan even before Yusuf was in the picture. According to intercepted messages between family members of Ridwan Tahi, they gave her a USB stick with secret information. She had to show Ridwan the information on this USB stick via her laptop and share his answers with the family. These family members could then take the necessary actions. One of the intercepted messages read, if she can take it with her Friday, that would be great. Then we will have a response within a week. Even better if she would print it out too. After going through PGP messages, the information on the USB stick referred to drug transports. Because shortly after, Ridwan's son messaged Rafael Imperiale about finances. Imperiale is the Italian mob boss Ridwan did business with, but who is interestingly enough also Faisal's father-in-law. Faisal's girlfriend is Rafael Imperiale's daughter. I will tell father. Hopefully in a few weeks, he will be able to reply. Once again, Inez Veski did not reply fast enough, upsetting Ridwan's son. A month later, the son contacted Imperiale once again. There's no way to communicate with him at the moment. Then, another month later, Ridwan finally replied via Inez. Ridwan's son was able to relay that answer back to Imperiale. The answer was a calculation about a payment for drugs. However, Ridwan also voiced his disappointment with Imperiale for apparently not keeping his accounting in check. He went on to say to his son that he should now exclude Imperiale from any further drug transports. Back to Inez's arrest. On June 1st, 2023, she was released from prison after it was determined that there were no more grounds to detain her any longer. Yet, she does remain a suspect in the case. 
Discussion arose whether Ridwan and his family forced her to do it, or if she cooperated freely, and if she maybe even had herself arrested because the pressure had gotten too much. Either way, she was suspended as a lawyer. On the 21st of April, 2023, Anwar Tahi was arrested. Anwar, yet another cousin of Ridwan, is considered to be an important associate in Ridwan's criminal organization. He had been arrested two times prior for his involvement in Ridwan's organization, but he had to be let go due to a lack of evidence. This time, it was different. Anwar is suspected of standing at the helm of his own sub-organization that was involved in stealing, sweeping, stashing, and prepping cars that would be used for hits Ridwan ordered. Besides that, Anwar is also suspected of drug smuggling as well as being directly involved in the hit of lawyer Dirk Viersen. Though he has always denied this, prosecutors think there is enough evidence to convict him this time. The case is still ongoing and the next court session is scheduled for the 14th of November. Then, at the end of July 2023, one of the last pieces still standing from Ridwan's organization was arrested. Remember? The son who Ridwan sent that kissing selfie to about seven years ago. It was his son, Faisal Tahi now 22 years old, who was arrested. The arrest was made at the request of the Dutch authorities, based on the suspicion that Faisal, also known as Genius, was a member of his father's criminal organization. Faisal Tahi, who studied in Dubai, denied the allegations against him. The Dutch government approved a treaty with the United Arab Emirates to facilitate extradition of criminals involved in organized crime a while back. Not long after this agreement, Faisal was arrested. However, he is yet to be extradited, despite the treaty being in full effect. According to insiders, an initial request for Faisal Tahi's extradition has been rejected by the Dubai court because the judge did not consider the suspicion serious enough. At the time of writing this, an appeal is pending. Investigating authorities assumed that Faisal took a leading role in the criminal organization after his father's arrest. He became the head of the family, taking care of his mother and his six siblings. This is according to Intercepted Communications, which we have covered earlier. Faisal Tahi allegedly co-directed the organization's drug trafficking and money laundering, plus plotted with his father to get him out of the Ebi by force. The case against Ridwan Tahi is so extensive that there is no verdict yet. Over the years, there have been a lot more crimes added to his trial. He is looking at life in prison, which looking at the case right now seems to be the suspected outcome. If what he is accused of is proven, Ridwan Tahi has brought a lot of destruction and violence to the world, especially the Netherlands. Never have the Dutch seen such violent acts such as taking out a lawyer, a crime reporter, the brother of a key witness, innocent people, and so on. However, despite what he is accused of, Ridwan can still count on the support of several people. They were even stood outside the courts once. What's the last ruling? Media for order. Fuck the media. Fuck the streets. It's going on. This was the story of Ridwan Tahi. I really appreciate you watching till the end. Please don't forget to leave a like, a comment sharing your thoughts, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already.